I mean, I can take the snow and everything. It's just the wind, you know, is like just just awful. Coping with the cold, our first taste of frigid temperatures this year. Tonight, how people are dealing with a deep freeze and how long the conditions are expected to last. Good evening. It's a story impacting anyone spending any time outside. Winter has fully arrived in the GTA. Temperatures taking a big plunge to start the week. CTV's Janice Golding has been speaking with people battling this bitter cold and joins us live with the details. How are you feeling tonight, Janice? Oh, it's pretty chilly out here, Michelle. Now, if you spent any time outdoors today, you know it is bitterly cold outside. So if you or your family members have to be outside for any reasons, make sure that you are dressed appropriately. Hat, scarf, mitts, the works. Don't be deceived by the sunshine. It's very cold. Toronto hit a high of minus 9 today, but it felt more like minus 16 with the wind chill. Just the wind. I mean, I can take the snow and everything. It's just the wind, you know, is like just, just awful. With the frigid temperatures expected to continue throughout the week, with wind chill values approaching minus 20 at times, it pays to bundle up. Winter boots, warm jacket, warm hat, scarf. He's ready to go. Listen, when you only weigh 10 pounds, you got to pack on the layers. Although not everyone paid heed to the weather warnings today. I don't know. I just don't want to wear boots. Are you dressed warm enough? Uh, no. You knew it was going to be cold today? Yes. No hat, no mitts. Just in my nails, that's why. <laughs> Given it's below 5 degrees Celsius, the city's warming centres are currently open. Our warming centres really are there to provide some surge capacity during the very, very cold weather as we're seeing right now. But we are always looking for more opportunities to shelter additional people who are, are looking for support. Just this weekend, we opened another 40 beds down at our respite at the Better Living Centre. We'll likely open additional beds there again tomorrow. The centres are pet friendly and are focused on getting vulnerable residents meals, resting spaces and referrals to emergency shelters. We're busy right now. Our call volume is about 100% double that normally we have at this point. The Canadian Automobile Association, meanwhile, says it's been swamped today and reminded motorists of the importance of keeping an emergency car kit. Emergency car kit should have things like a warm blanket, an extra pair of socks, and even a tea light with some matches. Uh, a tea light, the warmth of a tea light can help keep you warm for hours. Although the cold is expected to stick around right through the weekend, not everyone is complaining. I love it. The summer is hot, the winter is cold. That's it. It takes one to know the other. And if you're not as hardy as this man, don't worry. More seasonal temperatures are expected to return next week. Now, the CAA says that the majority of the calls it received related to battery failure and wants to remind people that batteries usually last anywhere between three and five years. So it's always a good idea to have your battery checked before the winter months start. Reporting live, I'm Janice Golding. Now back to Michelle. Thank you, Janice. And if you think it's cold here, it's even worse in Western Canada. People in Alberta have been cranking the heat so much so the province asked residents to limit their electricity use over the weekend. In Calgary, an extreme cold warning remains in place with temperatures dipping below minus 30. In Vancouver, lakes and ponds are frozen over, allowing skaters to enjoy some time outside. However, warmer weather is coming to much of B.C. this week. The conditions did bring a rare weather phenomenon to Okanagan Lake. The extreme cold created a sea smoke, a tornado-like effect that happens when cold air passes over warmer water. Still ahead, can you dig it? Bills fans helped clear the way for today's wild card game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. The latest from Snowy Buffalo coming up. <laughs> but first, let's head outside from the weather impacting so many people. Just how long will these cold conditions last? Jessica Smith is here with a look at what we're working with. We have, we're not used to it being this cold. <laughs> it's been quite warm this winter. It has. So it's a tough transition. It is. It's uh, quite the switch, right? We had such mild temperatures really to begin the first two weeks of 2024. But we've dipped down below seasonal. That's thanks to this cold Arctic air. It really sat over the prairies. Obviously very cold through B.C. and Alberta. Alberta, prompting extreme cold warnings. We're not quite in the criteria here just yet, but this cold really lasts right through to the end of the week. We're looking at still some snow squalls in towards areas through Niagara, Godrich, up towards Owen Sound, Perry Sound. Our friends in Buffalo still dealing with that snow and that cold. Here in the city, minus 10. It feels like minus 18. Those wind chills are wicked and they are going to last as we head in towards the end of the week. Coming up, a full look at your long range forecast, including a little snow on the way. But Michelle, I'll send things back over to you. Thank you, Jess. Also tonight at Capacity Air. Every night, demand for shelter beds exceeds supply. We check in on a winter respite program for youth as officials grapple with a troubling rise in youth needing help. 
with this cold weather also come concerns about respiratory illnesses. It seems like so many people have become sick lately. Today, Toronto's Board of Health received an update on how COVID-19 and influenza have been impacting the city. CTV's Allison Hurst joins us live with the details. Allison. City officials say that respiratory activity has remained high over the last few weeks and that they continue to see hospitalizations and deaths. This cold and flu season has been a long one, according to Toronto's public health. But at the board meeting this morning, a hint, we might be passing the peak of influenza. It's too early to say if influenza has peaked, but we have some indication um, that uh, that it may, it may be plateauing and starting to come down. Dr. Irene Armstrong also told the board while both influenza and COVID-19 levels remain high, COVID appears to be stabilizing. We've also seen quite a lot of respiratory um, illness visits to emergency departments, although there's been some recent indication that those numbers may be decreasing a little bit as well. Public health is still warning of a lot of circulation, which it says can be worse in colder weather. I luckily haven't been sick. My mom's sick right now. But I seen everybody's just kind of I once I see a sniffle and then that's it. They're not coming out the house for the week. So it's definitely going around. <laughs> We're in the middle of winter. I don't know. We get here every year and sometimes we forget. A lot of people I know have been getting sick. Public health officials still urge people when they're sick to stay home, take a COVID test and seek treatment if eligible. Many kids that we're seeing that have fevers for, you know, five or more days, many people, kids and adults with coughs that are lingering sometimes for weeks or months as well. Health professionals say there's no evidence this year was more severe. I'm hopeful that we kind of have burnt out this particular virus, but viruses come and go over viral season and it's still quite cold outside. We're indoors. We are mostly unmasked in most cases and therefore things can still spread. There are currently 72 COVID, 15 influenza and nine RSV outbreaks across the city's healthcare institutions. City officials say they are seeing outbreaks right across the city, but they're harder to track them in places like shelters because they're not required to report as they are in hospitals and long-term care facilities. Reporting live, I'm Allison Hurst. Back to you in studio. All right. Thank you, Allison. To the investigation into an aggressive arrest inside Scotiabank Arena over the weekend. A man facing charges after being detained by security. The altercation witnessed by Maple Leafs fans who watched it all unfold. CTV's Raheem Ladani joins us live with the latest on this story. Raheem. Michelle and Nathan, good evening. This incident happened just after the final horn of the Leafs game Saturday night, and that's when police say they were called to make an arrest here at Scotiabank Arena, and they allege that the man who has been charged spit at security and bit an officer. This cell phone video was taken by one of the dozens of bystanders who watched as security guards restrained a man on the floor at the Maple Leafs game Saturday night just before 10 o'clock. Another eyewitness who spoke to CTV News under anonymity says they saw what happened before the video starts. We observed the individual in the video as he was departing from around the VIP area holding his child. MLSE security personnel approached him seeking to engage in conversation. The man responded to the security team in a less than respectful manner and continued to walk away. As he moved further, security personnel approached and physically restrained him against a nearby wall while he was still holding his child. Police allege that event security attempted to check on the man's well-being, but he became confrontational. They claim he assaulted three security guards and later an officer who was called in to make an arrest. At one point in the video, a person on top of him appears to be seen striking him with his knee multiple times, both in the back of his head and in his face. A person off camera can be heard yelling to get off of him. Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment say MLSC is aware of the security incident that took place on Saturday, January 13th and is conducting a full investigation in cooperation with Toronto Police Service. Any update will be reserved pending the outcome of the investigation. Police have charged 37-year-old William Anderson of Ancaster with three counts of assault and one count of assaulting a peace officer. Police say that the man did receive medical attention from personnel who were on scene but refused further treatment. He is scheduled to appear in court on March 12th. Reporting live, I'm Raheem Ladani. Nathan, I'll send it back to you. All right, thank you, Raheem. The province's Special Investigations Unit is looking into an early morning crash in Mississauga. Investigators say an 18-year-old man was fleeing a traffic stop in a suspected stolen vehicle 
around 4.30 this morning when he collided with a My Way bus at Dixie and Burnham Thorpe. He was taken to hospital and treated for a serious injury. The special investigation unit is called in when police are involved in an incident that results in serious injury or death. There is a renewed effort to protect people living in long-term care homes in Ontario. The province has launched a new investigative unit. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris joins us live with the details. Siobhan. Well, Nathan, this is a team the minister says is intended to look at the most serious of cases, but some opponents to this plan say they think the government's efforts are misplaced. It's a move the Minister of Long-Term Care hopes puts long-term care home operators on notice. It won't take long for word to get out. You do not want one of these investigators at your home. A new 10-person inspection team meant to dig into the worst bad acts in homes caring for vulnerable seniors. Anywhere from a duty, per, duty to protect, for example, or failing to comply with orders or whistleblowing protection, which we know is a very important for the integrity of the system. The group has spent 19 weeks training. Their powers mean the possibility of harsher penalties for bad actors. Up until now, our ministry inspectors were limited on how they could attempt correct non-compliance. Thus, this new unit and its enhanced powers is a game changer for what is already the toughest long-term care inspection and enforcement regime in Canada. The government is pledging over $72 million for the unit. I'm not sure it'll make much of a difference. This long-term care researcher says the province has always had the power to punish operators for not taking proper care of residents. Most of these complaints could be dealt with by improving the training in these facilities and by providing appropriate levels of staffing. And she says unless and until the government puts effort and money there, you are going to have preventable error and negligence continue to unfold. Now, until we're all hearing a similar message tonight from the New Democrats, their critic says that this government, the government that stopped doing inspections of long-term care homes entirely during the first three months of the pandemic, can't be trusted now to keep long-term care operators accountable. Reporting live from Queen's Park, I'm Siobhan Morris. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Siobhan. Ontario's biggest child care operator is warning some centers are at risk of closing if issues with the national $10 a day program are not addressed. The YMCA claims the program's current funding model is not sustainable. The current model sees the fees parents pay for child care cut in half, with the province replacing that revenue to child care centers. However, the YMCA says many operators still face deficits. It's calling on the province to update how it compensates providers. The province says it's pushing for more money from Ottawa. The deadline is looming for businesses to repay their pandemic loans. But some say they're still struggling and are calling for an extension. CTV's Beth McTennell reports. You are looking at uh, hummus. To keep his Lebanese restaurant in Ancaster open during the COVID-19 pandemic, Mohamed Rabah took a $60,000 interest-free loan from the federal government. It's called the Canadian Emergency Business Account, or SIBA. Come Thursday, the money is due. I'm contemplating of closing down the business because I can't afford it. Rabah works 13 hours a day, seven days a week. He says inflation is high, business still isn't the same. He has a mortgage and a family. The option I need right now is an extension by the government to give us another uh, until the end of the year of 2024. And that will be sufficient for things change. This needs to be a wake-up call for the provincial conservatives. Amid an affordability crisis, the provincial NDP wants the Ford government to apply more pressure on Ottawa. The government says it too supports a year extension and has written to the feds. Borrowing gave Toronto's old spaghetti factory a lifeline. Its loan now repaid, but that's not the case for everyone. Toronto could be hit especially hard if many businesses are unable to repay their loans. According to numbers from the NDP, 40% of businesses that took the loans were here in Ontario, many of which are here in Toronto. It's not your favorite bakery that might close or your favorite restaurant, but that ripple effect, the cascading effect of this is significantly more than just that one business. Canada's finance minister's office tells CTV News over half of SIBA loans have been repaid and there are repayment options to make it easier for businesses. You're stressed out, you're, you get tired, what are you supposed to get? You're always thinking, instead of thinking about the business, you're thinking how I'm supposed to come up with this money. To 
Raba says for his restaurant, he needs that extension. Beth McDonnell, CTV News. With the cold weather, it seems like this may be far from mine, but applications and renewals are now open for this summer's Cafe TO Curb Lane program. Restaurant and bar operators interested in expanding their dining space outdoors can apply for a permit. Online applications will be accepted until March 1st, with the expectation that 90% of Curb Lane cafes will be installed by the Victoria Day weekend. A man who helped shape Canada's political landscape for over two decades will receive a state funeral. Ed Broadbent was a highly respected leader of the NDP and champion for disadvantaged persons. He died on January 11th at the age of 87. Today, the Prime Minister announced there will be a state funeral in Ottawa on January 28th. Justin Trudeau says the public event will allow Canadians an opportunity to offer their condolences and pay tribute to the legacy of the much-loved national figure. In the Middle East, Palestinian authorities now say more than 24,000 people have been killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began. Israel struck Gaza City today as its soldiers fought militants in the south. Israeli officials say the offensive will soon be scaled back, but no timeline was given. The defense minister also ruled out a ceasefire, saying military pressure is the only way to win the release of more than 100 hostages still being held by Hamas. A delegation of five Canadian members of parliament are in the Middle East to hear from Palestinians. With a lot of um, crisis that happens around the world, certainly being in the uh, humanitarian space, we know that attention spans can be limited uh, for, for the media. So we are trying to uh, make sure that uh, what's, what's happening in Gaza, uh, we can find a way uh, for the hostilities to end, for there to be a permanent and immediate ceasefire uh, so that humanitarian aid can get through. The five Liberal and New Democrat MPs are expected to hear how Canada can help Palestinian people in need and help bring peace to the region. They're joined on this trip by Islamic Relief Canada and other civil society groups. Militant attacks in the Red Sea are affecting shipping operations in this country. Two-thirds of vessels due in Halifax later this month are now expected to arrive late. The average price of shipping containers reportedly has doubled since mid-December. Shipments to Canada's West Coast ports remain largely unaffected so far. Today, Houthi rebels struck an American-owned cargo vessel with an anti-ship ballistic missile. There was a fire in a hold, but no injuries. A volcanic eruption in Iceland has calmed down considerably, but it's too soon to declare the danger over. Scientists don't know how long this eruption will last, and there are indications magma is still flowing underground. Lava damaged buildings on the outskirts of Grandavik yesterday, but its 3,800 residents were evacuated ahead of time. Defensive walls stopped much of the flow from reaching the town. This is the second eruption in less than a month. The first contest in a months-long process to choose this year's Republican presidential candidate gets underway in Iowa later tonight. Participants will debate their options before casting secret ballots in what is being called a race for second place. CTV's Joy Malvin reports. It is cold. And yes, people in Iowa know how to deal with winter just like Canadians, but this is bitter. Sub-zero temperatures, what's likely going to be the coldest caucus night in Iowa history. And that has many people concerned about voter turnout. Woo! Trump 2024! Donald Trump and his supporters are the most enthusiastic. Woo! And he's confident they'll show up for him in big numbers. If the polls are correct, he's dominated this race with a double-digit lead, even downplaying the weather. You can't sit home. If you're sick as a dog, you say, darling, I gotta make it. Even if you vote and then pass away, it's worth it. His campaign is concerned caucus goers could be complacent and just stay home, given that the polls are predicting a landslide victory for the former president. Neither the cold nor Trump's legal problems will stop Terry and Julia Sleep from voting for him. I like the fact that he's far ahead, but that's not the reason I've selected him. Um, he's a proven leader. He did like Ron DeSantis, and I think that 
maybe there's a time for him, but I don't think his time is right now. Hey, how's it going? Good. Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis is fighting for his political survival here, building an army of supporters, knocking on nearly a million doors, hoping it'll pay off and his supporters will brave the cold for him. We don't go by the polls. I think that they've historically not p predicted who's going to win. The most recent polling has the only woman in the race, Nikki Haley, pushing into second place. She has momentum, and her call for a new generation to lead resonates with some as an alternative to Trump. We have an, we have an option to either go back to the past and deal with the names of Trump and Biden in the past, or we can go forward in the future. And we may know tonight just how strong Donald Trump's grip is on the Republican Party, or whether a challenger will emerge who can take him on in the New Hampshire primary next week. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Des Moines, Iowa. And CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver is also in Des Moines, Iowa tonight. She joins us live now. Annie, the polls show a slam dunk for Donald Trump, but could there be any surprises? What's top of mind for you? Well, look, it's politics, so I think that there are always surprises. I think top of mind is what kind of a lead will Donald Trump come out of Iowa with? Will it be the 30 points that the polls are suggesting he will have now? Or will some of his voters decide to stay home in the cold? Or will, at the very last minute, people decide to change their mind and go with a different candidate? Um, what we're all really watching is this fight for second place, as Joy was talking about in that item. How close will DeSantis and Nikki Haley be? A big upset would be DeSantis coming in second, which polls don't show is the case currently. That would be a big upset, especially moving into the primary where Nikki Haley is gaining momentum. So that's something that a lot of experts say DeSantis really needs. He needs to come second or he needs to come a very close third if he wants to keep momentum and he wants to keep this campaign in motion. It was an interesting clip from Trump there saying you got to come out and vote despite the weather. Even if you vote and pass out, it was worth it. Who might suffer the most from the fallout of people just not wanting to go out in the cold? Well, we have to remember that there's more, I think there's six candidates in this race still. Not all of them are actually getting enough support to even be considered in the polls. So some of those candidates, you know, for example, Asa Hutchinson, the former governor of Arkansas, he's polling at 1%. So that's somebody that's probably going to suffer from low voter turnout. His voters are probably going to say, you know what, it's not worth it. The other one is going to be Ron DeSantis as well as Nikki Haley. That is where you could see some interesting changes in their overall percent of the vote. Both of them are desperate to have every single person that's supporting them that has said they will support them get to the polling station and that's why people are calling them reminding them to get out to vote the campaigns are even offering to drive people those two are so neck and neck Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis need every single supporter at a caucus station tonight every single one of them needs to be caucusing to have their voices heard otherwise we could see some type of change in the result and those two coming even closer together than the polls are even suggesting right now before we let you go is this going to be a long night when are we expecting the results so we were, were told that some of the small rural caucuses could be having results within 45 minutes of voting. The much uh, bigger caucuses with hundreds of people could take much longer. But we were just being told that perhaps there would be a result by midnight tonight central time, which is around 1 a.m. Eastern time. That's when they're hoping to have all the results in. But of course, you never know. And you look back to 2020, the Democrats had some issues with their count. Uh, so who knows? But it seems like the party is estimating to hopefully have the votes counted by around 1 a.m. Eastern time. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver live in Des Moines, Iowa for us tonight. Thank you. Americans pause to honor a transformative figure in history. Today is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. It feels like we're going backward and not forward. So Martin Luther King Jr. holiday gives us the opportunity to turn to each other, to support, to work with each other, to volunteer and engage in service. My mom always said it's a day on, not a day off. There was a memorial at the Civil Rights Leaders Memorial location in Washington, D.C. Communities across the United States paid tribute on King's birthday in a variety of ways, from prayer services to parades. Joe Biden marked the day with an act of service. The U.S. president volunteered at a nonprofit food bank in Philadelphia. He stuffed donation boxes and spoke to workers at the organization. This is the third straight year Biden has offered his services there. The 29th annual Greater Philadelphia Martin Luther King Day of Service is billed as the first and largest of its kind in the nation. To a very big dig out south of the border. Winter weather not stopping diehard football fans. Yeah, we're in Buffalo tonight where an army of shovelers made sure a playoff game could proceed. Sean Leethong is live outside Highmark Stadium with the story. Sean. 
Well, Michelle and Nathan, they did a pretty good job outside. Inside, they got the field clear, but many of the bleachers still had snow on them when the game started. But this game had to go ahead, even though it had to be postponed once. It's an atmosphere that Bills fans are used to. What's going to happen today? Buffalo victory. Let's go. This is the perfect playoff weather. Are you kidding me? This is football. A warm fire and what feels like a tradition for some NFL playoff football in January. It's good atmosphere, it's good vibes. I'm really grateful to be here. I know everyone else is, Steelers, Bills fans all around having a great time. I don't even know what to expect. It's probably going to be unreal. But today's AFC wildcard game between the Buffalo Bills and Pittsburgh Steelers comes after fans had to help shovel Highmark Stadium out from under a mountain of snow. I don't think there's much that will stop the Buffalo Bills from playing this game. I mean, this city deserves a championship. <laughs> The team offering $20 an hour this weekend to anyone who would help dig out. They had plenty of shovels, but, you know, they said prefer to bring your own shovel just in case they don't want to run out, you know. On Saturday, New York Governor Kathy Horchel announcing that Sunday's game would be postponed to Monday due to weather. Had to reschedule, reschedule a lot of plans, but we made it here, yeah. So we got it before the storm hit, not knowing that the game had been changed, and then once it got changed, we decided to stick around for a while. And with more than a meter of snow following over the weekend, today was a mix of cleanup and turn up as fans braved the conditions hoping to keep warm and cheer on the Bills. They deal with a lot more snow than we do in London. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah the, the, the lake effect is a lot more. You gotta get back home, feel like waves of nostalgia every time, and then way too much anxiety about some horrible outcome, but trust that they're gonna figure it out. Go Bills, man, go Bills. Yeah, so Bills fans feel like the weather is an advantage to them. It's minus nine right now, and so far it's working out. It's just in the third quarter right now, and Buffalo is winning 21-7. to Reporting live, I'm Sean Lee Thong. Michelle, send it back to you. Thanks, Sean. Coming up, a key moment in a historic climate case. A group of young Ontarians back in court in their fight against the Ontario government's climate plan, which they allege threatens people's lives. And I'm Pat Foran coming up on Consumer Alert. Now that cold weather has arrived, many people may be thinking about taking a vacation down south. Is there really such a thing as a last minute deal or is that a myth? When is the best time to book a trip? I'll have my reports just ahead. Bundling up is the way to go throughout this entire week. We stay below seasonal right through to the weekend. For the kids heading off to school tomorrow, likely to see some snow early on in, this mor in the morning, uh, some lake effect flurries, but it clears out as we head into the lunch hour. The sunshine remains and the cold as well. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long wind forecast and give you an idea of when we return to more seasonal weather. Now that the temperature has dropped considerably, more people are likely thinking about a vacation down south. And if that's you, when is the best time to book a trip? We often hear about last minute travel deals, but with companies using dynamic pricing, a bargain can be hard to find. Pat Foran explains on Consumer Alert. Pat. Nathan and Michelle, according to the Flight Center, the best time to book a vacation is about three months in advance. That doesn't mean you can't find a deal at the last minute, but if you do, there may be a reason why it's so cheap. This flight center location in Toronto was busy with sun seekers looking to get away from our winter weather. Sun destinations is the focus, correct? We know that Canadians are searching, they've got the Monday blues, January is typically a gloomy month, so everyone is searching for a vacation right now. Many travelers would love to get a last minute deal, but with dynamic pricing, that's now much harder to do. Every time a seat becomes unavailable, that means your price increases for your flight. Flight Center says the best time to book a vacation in Canada and the U.S. is 76 days in advance. To Mexico and the Caribbean, it's 79 days. And to Europe, it's 93 days ahead of time. You may find a last-minute deal, but if you do, there might be a reason why the price is lower. If you do find uh, a last-minute deal, Ask yourself, why is this so cheap? Why is this price so rare right now? Because chances are there's construction happening or renovation happening at the resort or potentially the flights are just inconvenient. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. You just never know which direction it's going to go. 
Travel expert Lauren Christie says planning a vacation at the last minute can be risky. He also advises to book in advance and says you should look at the entire package and not just the price. I think people sometimes they're looking for the best deal. And sometimes I think people can get stuck on that. Look for the best value. Right. It's two different things. You may have heard that Tuesday is the best day of the week to buy a ticket, but Flight Center says that's also a myth. They say a deal is when you find a package that works for you, which could be any day of the week. And if you're planning to go away for March break, now is the time to look at what's available. According to the Flight Center's data, the top three destinations this year for Canadians are the Dominican Republic, Mexico and Jamaica. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. All right, to the forecast, you know, if somebody's not dressed for the cold, you really notice it. It's extreme. Yeah, I found it really <laughs> tough this morning. Really, really tough. And we just, we just haven't had the chance to acclimatize, I think. We're not quite in extreme cold morning territory, but it doesn't mean it's not cold, right? We've had those wind chills in the morning in that minus 20 range, and that's cold no matter where you're from, who you are. It is going to stay chilly, though, for the rest of the week. So a heads up, just give yourself that extra time in the morning to put on those layers because you are going to need them. Frostbite can happen very quickly when you have wind chill values between minus 10 to minus 28. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. The trade-off with all the cold is the little bit of sunshine that we've had. It's been a while since we've seen that blue sky, and it has been back today in a beautiful way, but it is cold. All that cold Arctic air that has been sitting through portions of, of the prairies has really made its way towards us here in Ontario, and we are wickedly cold. It is just cold in comparison to how mild it has been. We're at minus 11 right now. It feels like minus 19. Northern Ontario, those wind chill values are into the minus 30 range. As we head through the evening, we'll feel about minus 8. Team. We're watching for the chance of flurries really from midnight through to about the midpoint of our day tomorrow. Some light lake effect snow, maybe two centimeters. Really and truly, it is the wind chill that becomes the more uh, pressing issue and as we head throughout the rest of the week. But again, that cloud cover, that snow clears out kind of right around the lunch hour. And then we have sunshine into the afternoon. It's not warm sunshine, but sunshine nonetheless. We still have seen a few lake effect flurries through prompting some statements and warnings along that kind of eastern shoreline of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay and uh, kind of that that border between you know Buffalo and, and Niagara where obviously it's been very cold and they've had a lot of snow. The bulk of that low though is going to push its way past us and tomorrow we do eventually get a bit of a break. Temperature wise it is going to stay cold again the bulk of this flirt activity really is from about 4 a.m. through to about noon and then it makes its way out. We will start to see a bit of a break up in the cloud deck as we head into the late afternoon just before the sunset and then as we get into Wednesday a little more sunshine. Again that cloud cover lifts and it kind of gets rid of that layer of warmth that we had to really start the first two weeks of January. Getting into the day tomorrow, again, still below seasonal. The flurries to start the day, then sunshine in the afternoon. But that wind chill wicked as we head in towards that midpoint of our day. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the chance of flurries is going to linger. Likely to see some heavier snow as the system makes its way in as we end the week. And then looking ahead to the weekend, we start to return very slowly back towards a more seasonal kind of daytime high and low. Really, it isn't until Sunday and Monday that we get back to where we should be. There is a warm-up kind of on the way as we head into next week. We just have to get there first but for now cold but at least it's a little sunny michelle nathan thank you jess thanks a group of young people is taking the ontario government to court in a quest for our future they filed a case with the court of appeal over the province's emissions targets as ctv's john woodward reports they're claiming doing too little on the climate file is unconstitutional because mainly young people will have to live with the consequences for the seven young Canadians fighting the province's climate change plan in court, it's very personal. I'm worried about having children because I have to ask myself, how am I going to survive the climate crisis? Concerns faced by many young people, including 16-year-old climate activist Sophia Mathur. Scientists are saying that climate change is going to get worse in the future. And obviously, I'm going to still be alive in, hopefully... 40, 50 years when this is going to be really prevalent and really bad. The group claimed in court Ontario's plan to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 30% by 2030 was just not good enough. And because it affected young people more than anyone else, it was also unconstitutional. We're asking the court to both order that the target is unconstitutional and also order Ontario to set a new target as aligned with science. The previous trial judge found that Ontario's climate targets fell severely 
severely short of what the scientific consensus said it would take to limit the planet's warming. But she found those government actions did not amount to a violation of rights. The plaintiffs hope this higher court will do more, the case attracting interveners from as far away as B.C. This is a precedent that applies to all levels of government in Canada. There have been several successful cases in places like the Netherlands and Germany. Youth across Ontario are feeling those effects now and are going to feel it when these governments and these people that are making these decisions are no longer alive. Judges continue to hear arguments this week. John Woodward, CTV News. Also tonight, helping to get more young people out from the cold. Covenant House increases capacity for youth, but people are still being turned away. We have the details. When cold weather hits, finding shelter is essential, but not everyone has a reliable roof over their head. It is one of the services provided by Covenant House. And today, CTV's Mike Walker on why it's so important during a weather week like this one. 30 cots set up in a gymnasium, each one with a care package. All will be occupied tonight by a young person. I used to sleep here in this corner. The new winter respite program at Covenant House has been a lifeline for 19-year-old Victoria. A refugee from Kenya, she arrived in Canada in mid-November and struggled to find shelter. I didn't know where to go. Like I slept outside. Outside it's cold. The temperature, oh, it's so bad. People can die from winter. Covenant House started the program last year with the financial backing of donors. This winter, the city is funding the program, which is in addition to its 96 youth bed shelter. These young people have nowhere else to go, so this provides them safety, shelter, connection to services. At a time when demand for shelter beds is greater than the supply, Covenant House says its demand from youth 16 to 24 years old has increased by 30% present we, we do not have enough shelter beds dedicated to young people trend is continuing I, I mean obviously these these are difficult economic times the cost of food is up the cost of rent is up but the respite beds are not enough every night the shelter is turning young people away an issue they wanted to highlight with the mayor we need to think about the causes of homelessness who toured the facility this afternoon around 5,000 health care visits a year annually vowing to increase funding for shelters and support services this year as budget deliberations begin. That includes a potential double-digit property tax increase. $82 million more to keep 450 shelter beds open and fund more warming centre and respite centres. The youth shelter system needs to be enhanced to be able to respond to the needs of young people in our city. We need prevention services as well. Victoria has now transitioned to a shelter bed and is receiving support. They showed me like Victoria can go back to school, Victoria you can work. But given the immediate need, Covenant House is working with the city, hoping to expand the winter respite beds as the deep freeze sets in. Mike Walker, CTV News. The delayed 75th Primetime Emmy Awards air tonight. The television awards show was put on hold for several months because of the Hollywood actors and writers strikes. HBO shows dominate this year's nominations with Succession leading the pack with 27 nods. The Last of Us received 24 nominations while White Lotus got 23. All three are competing for Best Drama Series. And the Critics' Choice Awards were handed out last night. Paul Giamatti won Best Actor for his role in The Holdovers, while Emma Stone took home Best Actress for Poor Things. Oppenheimer director Christopher Nolan won Best Picture. Best Song saw an upset with Just Ken from the film Barbie winning the award. Have you ever heard the old saying, behind every great man is a great woman? Well, you could argue that was the case for Johnny Cash. June Carter Cash was a successful musician before and after their marriage to the man in black. Now there's a new documentary which tells her story. CTV's Andrea Case joins us with more. Andrea. Nathan and Michelle, good evening. Yes, I've got their music playing in my head. That's why I'm moving. Quote, the documentary is called June, and who better tell the story than one of her daughters, Carlene Carter Cash. And she, along with the director, was in town today. Would you welcome June Carter Cash? June Carter Please Cash. Welcome. June, June Carter, Carter Cash. Cash. My mom was, uh, was so many things, and this documentary really shows that. Hello, I'm Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash was June Carter Cash's third and last husband. But long before they met, she was an accomplished singer-songwriter, a member of the famous Carter family group. I'm doing the best that I can to carry on this legacy and keep the Carter family music alive. 
And, you know, we're coming off on our 100 year anniversary since the first recordings and in 1927. So uh, it's all, you know, it's all worked out. Everybody's ready to hear this story. I think that a lot of times women, when they're next to a man, can be reduced to kind of a muse or a sidekick. And I think that people are ready to hear that she, she was so much more than that. Now her story has been told in the documentary June, produced by her daughter and Grammy-nominated musician Carlene Carter Cash, behind the lens, award-winning director Kristen Vario. And also, too, that it'll inspire other women to keep, to not have an expiration date on when they're going to stop living their dream, mm -hmm. you know, because she, she continued on and, and won, her, won her Grammys that were hers that, uh, in, her, in her 70s. Love. Is a burning thing. I don't know if a lot of people know that she wrote Ring of Fire. But I fell in love. Carter Cash has had her own long musical career and has no plans to slow down. It's children told, told by my mom and my grandmother, now when we're all gone, you have to keep this going. You have to keep the music alive. And so that's what my primary purpose is, is to do that and to add to it. Mm. The telling of the Carter family musical tradition will continue. Carlene is in the process of writing a book about her topsy-turvy life, she calls it, but always coming back to her roots. June premieres on Paramount Plus tomorrow, Tuesday, January 16th. For CTV News, I'm Andrea Case. The Stars Tonight is brought to you by Lastman's Bad Boy, court-approved liquidation sale. On the next CP24 Breakfast. Educator and anti-racism advocate Matthew Morris will be stopping by to discuss his new book, Black Boys Like Me, Confrontations with Race, Identity and Belonging. CP24 Breakfast, up first at 5.30. Winter boots, warm jacket, warm hat, scarf. He's ready to go. Listen, when you only weigh 10 pounds, you gotta pack on the layers. Updating our top stories, frigid temperatures in the GTA are expected to last into the weekend. And warming centers in Toronto are open, with organizers working to address the uptick in demand. 37-year-old William Anderson is facing charges after police allege he bit an officer and spat at security guards while being taken into custody at Scotiabank Arena over the weekend. The arrest unfolded in front of dozens of Maple Leafs fans who recorded and circulated videos on social media. My mom's sick right now, but I see everybody's just kind of, I, once I see a sniffle and then that's it, they're not coming out the house for the week. Toronto public health officials in Toronto say the level of respiratory illnesses in the city remains high, but it does appear to be decreasing following a wave of infections over the holidays. Health experts are still urging people to stay home when sick and get treatment if needed in order to curb the spread. On the markets, the Canadian dollar is down a fraction to close at 74.45 U.S. American benchmark oil lost 18 cents to end the day at 72.61 a barrel. And the TSX Composite Index gained 71 points to finish at 21,061. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. As of today, Ontarians will be receiving the federal carbon tax rebate. Now, they're going out in the mail or landing directly in bank accounts. But only those who filed income tax and benefit returns will get the rebate. Folks in Alberta, Manitoba, New Brunswick and Saskatchewan are also eligible because the carbon price is collected there too. National home sales saw an unexpected surge at the end of 2023, and that looks to continue this year. The Canadian Real Estate Association is predicting a 10.4% year-over-year increase in the number of residential properties being sold this year, and for the national average home price to climb 2.3%. It's projected interest rate cuts may start to happen as soon as this spring. Tonight, Republican rivals battle for votes in Iowa. The challenge for uh, anybody not named Donald Trump is to be able to survive. The 2024 race for the White House kicks off. That story and more later on CTV National News. A reminder, the CTV News at 6 podcast is available to download every weeknight. And a special greeting to those of you listening to the newscast live on News Talk 1010.
A retired police officer in Ottawa is still reeling after he won the Sick Kids Foundation's Catch the Ace jackpot. Robert Aikens is taking home the more than $1.1 million reward, and he plans on giving back. There's Aikens and his dog, Galetta, celebrating the big win. Galetta was the inspiration behind a charity for rescue dogs, and with his newfound fortune, Aikens plans on deepening his contributions to animal shelters and rescues across the country. He also plans on donating a portion to food banks and becoming a monthly and legacy donor to the Sick Kids Foundation. Doing a lot of good things. Mm -hmm. All the best. That's amazing. It is. We're not hitting the weather jackpot <laughs> at all. Although we, you did mention we yeah. did get sun today, which was nice. You know, I kind of forgot the sky was blue for a while because it's been so dark, but it's nice. It's just going to be very, very cold. So keep that in mind as you head throughout the rest of the week. Layers are going to be key. Now, we are going to see a little bit of a warm-up as we head into the weekend, but that really is just back towards a more seasonal forecast. Over the next seven days, you know, it stays chilly. We're watching for flurries tomorrow morning, so give yourself time on that commute, but it clears out in the evening. And then as we head towards the weekend, sunshine and more seasonal temperatures. I'm not trying to skip through the week personally, but I am really looking forward to it not being so, so cold. And a reminder, Tuesday's Lotto Max jackpot is an estimated $70 million plus 10 max million. Thank you so much. Yes, that's it for us, but be sure to join Omar Sachedina later tonight for CTV National News, followed by Natalie Johnson with our next local newscast at 1130. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us here at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a great night.